What is the best way to get ripped for a photo shoot or an event? Is it harmful to eat below your BMR? How should Bigger, Leaner, Stronger and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger or similar programs be modified for intermediate or advanced weightlifters? And should I stop eating red meat? Those are the questions I'm gonna be answering in today's Q&A. And quickly, if you want me to answer one of your questions in an upcoming Q&A episode, just send it or multiple questions. If you have multiple questions, send them to me via email, mike at muscleforlife.com, just muscle for life spelled out, dot com, or Instagram DMs is another okay way to reach me. It's a bit of a pain in the ass to stay on top of DMs, so email is the best, but you will almost certainly get a reply if you DM me, I do tend to miss some though. If you email me, you will certainly, certainly get a reply. You might just have to wait a week or two because I get a lot of emails. And then if your question is something that a lot of other people also tend to ask that I haven't already answered on the podcast or on my YouTube channel or in an article, or if it just strikes me as something that could be useful to my crowd, then I will choose it for one of the next Q&A episodes. All right, so let's start with the first question. What's the best way to get ripped for a photo shoot or an event? And first, let's just quantify ripped. So for guys, let's say anywhere between 7 and 10% body fat, with 7% being very lean, very cut, and 10% being fairly lean, fairly cut. And in women, those numbers would look like 15% body fat would be shredded as a woman up to 20% body fat, which would be lean and athletic, but a bit softer and less cut than 15%. So how do you do it? How do you get that impressively lean and cut and chiseled and insert every other stupid buzzword look? Well, I just alluded to it because the number one important thing is simply your body fat percentage. It is simply getting lean enough. And I guess I, I should add that it's it's getting lean enough without losing any muscle to speak of, or at least with minimizing muscle loss, depending on how lean you're trying to get. If you are a natural bodybuilder, for example, and you need to get down to like four or 5% body fat for a competition, you're going to lose some muscle along the way, but you can minimize it. You can lose as little muscle as possible. And so what that means then is as far as tactics go, as far as how to actually get there, the most important thing is just giving yourself enough time to lose the amount of body fat that you need to lose, not trying to rush the process with starvation dieting, which sure it's going to drop body fat, but it's also going to cut away at your muscle, not trying to overload yourself with an excessive amount of physical activity and especially cardio, because that too will accelerate fat loss, but it will also accelerate muscle loss and just make you feel miserable. And that process of just fundamentally dieting well is far more important than any sort of shortcuts or hacks you might hear about regarding manipulating your water or your sodium or your carbohydrate intakes, because those strategies for most people don't help. Most of the time, those strategies, no matter how intricate they may seem or evidence-based they may seem, just end up making you look smaller and flatter on the day of the shoot or the event, and also can make it very hard to get much of a pump, which of course makes you look better. And that's why if you look at some of the peak week protocols of some of the successful natural bodybuilders out there, it's not very much. It's pretty straightforward. It's more or less what I just laid out, giving yourself plenty of time to get lean and then bringing your calories up and carbs up into a show so you look full and can get a nice big pump. A lot of it comes down to that. Many competitors, successful natural competitors, don't manipulate sodium or water whatsoever. And as far as carbs go, they may bring their carb intake up a couple days before the show, and that's just to facilitate getting a pump. And to that point, 
I myself have had success with that. So in the past, when I've gotten quite lean for photo shoots, I would do exactly what I just told you, give myself plenty of time, get very lean, and then uh, three or four days or so before the shoot, I would just bring my calories back up to around maintenance, and I would do it by just adding a bunch of carbs. And what I found then is then on the day of the shoot, I was able to get a much bigger pump than just three or four weeks before when my, carbo when my carbohydrate intake was quite a bit lower because I was still cutting. And if you want to see how this plays out for your body, just pay attention to how you look. Take some pictures when you're cutting, say when you're deeper into a cut, when you're getting toward the end of your cut, so you're lean and you take a, a short diet break or maybe a few days to refeed where you're increasing your carbohydrate intake quite a bit. Take some pictures on the days of those, uh, those break days or those refeed days, as well as the days that follow, I would say up to maybe five days that follow and just see where your sweet spot seems to be, see where you tend to look best. And then you can simply use that information to inform how you would prepare for a photo shoot or an event. So you would cut and you'd get plenty lean, and then you'd start to bring your calories and your carbs up. And let's say it's, after three days of that or four days of that, you're looking really good. Well, then you know that's how you plan for your photo shoot or your event. A few other tips that help for photo shoots are making sure that you have some color in your skin, making sure that you are not pale because simply getting a tan can make you look like one to two percent leaner. <laughs> And getting a pump before the pictures, of course, makes a difference. It can make a very big difference. Putting some oil on your body makes a difference. And having good lighting makes a huge difference. You might be surprised how much better or worse you can look based on lighting alone. You can be very lean and look fantastic and go in the wrong lighting and look very meh. And then you can go in the right lighting and look outstanding. So it's worth putting a little bit of time into figuring out the lighting and using lighting that uh, enhances your physique, not detracts from it. Okay, the next question here, is it harmful to eat below your BMR? No, I wouldn't say it's harmful. It's not inherently harmful, but do keep in mind that the less food you eat when you're cutting, the more you're going to have to deal with hunger and cravings and metabolic adaptation, and the more you risk developing nutritional deficiencies and losing muscle and the less energy that you have in general, the harder it is to not only get through your workouts, but just get through your life, get through your days. So that's why I don't recommend eating below BMR for any extended period of time. And you shouldn't have to, unless you are a natural bodybuilder who needs to get extremely unhealthily lean for a short period of time to compete, you do not need to be eating below your BMR. And I would say that even applies for, to, to women as well where below BMR eating is more common because they just burn less energy on average because they have smaller bodies. And so many women, especially women who are not very active, who don't exercise very much, when they start running their numbers in order to maintain a decent calorie deficit, they often find that that would entail eating below BMR. And my recommendation to those women though, is to figure out how to increase physical activity. Let's bump up your total daily energy expenditure so we can create a large enough gap between energy intake and output to drive meaningful fat loss without having to drop calorie intake below BMR. And if that's not possible, and in some cases it's not, I understand some people, um, again, this is mostly something that I come across with women, but sometimes with men as well. So some people are too busy, like they only can exercise a couple hours per week and that just is what it is. And I understand that. And in that case, I would say that instead of just eating below BMR every day, I would rather have you take one of two different approaches. So the first would be eating above BMR, even if that means that your calorie deficit is smaller than you would like it to be. So let's say you would like to lose somewhere around a pound of fat per week, which would require a weekly deficit of something around 3,500 calories. And if doing that would, make, would mean that you have to be eating below your BMR 
um, every day, at least five days a week. Instead of that, I would rather have you eat more calories and let's shrink that calorie deficit, maybe even by 50%. And let's just target a half a pound of fat loss per week. And by doing that, you're going to have to be more patient. It's going to take more time to reach your goal, but you are going to have an easier time getting there. It's going to be more enjoyable. You are going to have better workouts. You're going to have more energy throughout the day. You are going to be less food obsessed, and you're going to be more likely to, to hold on to your hard-earned muscle. Now, the second approach is kind of just a spin on the first one. If that doesn't work for you because the calorie deficit would be so small that the fat loss would be almost insignificant, or if you just need to lose fat faster than that, or you want to lose fat faster than that, then I would say if you need to eat below BMR a couple days per week to get that extra fat loss, that's okay. So let's say maybe two or three days per week below BMR, but then on those other days, eat above your BMR, cycle your calories, so to speak. Now, on those other days, you don't have to eat maintenance, of course. You can still be in a deficit, but just don't be in as big of a deficit as you are when you are eating below your BMR. Okay, the next question. How should Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger be modified, or, or similar programs, be modified for intermediate and advanced weightlifters? Well, this is a timely question because I'm in the middle of wrapping up a new... I would, it's not just new and improved. It's really f from scratch, rewritten from scratch, new second edition of my book, Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, which is a sequel to Bigger, Leaner, Stronger and is intended for intermediates and advanced weightlifters. And there's a lot of information in this book. It's shaping up to be probably the same size as Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, I believe, is 130-ish thousand words. And BBLS 2.0 is, I, I don't have the final word count yet, but it's probably going to be upward of 100 to 120,000 words. And so I couldn't hope to summarize all of that here. But the primary change that you need to make in bigger leaner stronger and this would apply to thinner leaner stronger as well as you move from your beginner phase as a weightlifter into your intermediate phase uh, bls and tls can take you into your intermediate phase but there is a point where you will stop making progress and the primary reason for that and thus the primary change you need to make is you simply have to work harder in the gym now. So bigger, leaner, stronger, and thinner, leaner, stronger have you doing nine to 12 hard sets per major muscle group per week. It's mostly nine. And that at some point, somewhere in year two or so for most people, that becomes insufficient volume to continue making progress. And by continue making progress, what I'm referring to is continue gaining whole body strength, continue adding weight to the bar or dumbbells over time. And so that does remain the primary goal as an intermediate and advanced weightlifter. Nothing changes in that regard. You are still trying to progressively overload your muscles. And the best way to do that is to just get stronger, to just add weight to the bar over time, add weight to the dumbbells over time. And that means that your 1RMs, for example, on your big compound lifts should be going up over time. It's going to be a lot slower going than when you were new, but they should be trending upward. And your strength on your accessory exercises should also be trending upward over time. How do you keep effectively doing that, though? As a beginner, it's very straightforward. You really don't need anything more complicated, I think, than a double progression model where you're working in a given rep range. And when you hit the top of that rep range with a weight for anywhere from one, two to three sets based on the programming, you move up in weight. That plus a moderate amount of volume, somewhere around 10 hard sets per major muscle group per week is really all you need in the beginning to gain all the muscle that you are going to be able to gain and all the strength that you're going to be able to gain. And it works quite well for upward of even two years for some people. I'd say on average probably a year uh, to a year and a half before the gears start to grind. And what people will find, and I know this firsthand because I've heard from so many people who have done my Bigger, Leaner, Stronger and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger prog programs over the years, is eventually those programs just become maintenance programs. Eventually, following the programs as laid out in the books doesn't result in any meaningful increases in muscle and strength. And that's to be expected. I know that those programs are not enough for people who want to get as muscular and as strong as they possibly can, given their 
genetics. I would say those programs are enough for most people's fitness goals. Most guys who just want to gain anywhere from 25 to maybe 30 pounds of muscle and then get their body fat down to around 10% and stay there. You can do that with just bigger, leaner, stronger. You actually don't need anything else. For women, it's probably about half that in terms of muscle gain, somewhere around 15 pounds of muscle in the right places, 20-ish percent body body fat. So that's a very lean, athletic, but still feminine look. You don't really need anything other than thinner, leaner, stronger to get there. But if you want to gain the last let's say 20 or 30% that's available to you. So bigger, leaner, stronger, and thinner, leaner, stronger are there to give you, let's say, upward of 70 or 80% of the muscle and strength that you're going to be able to gain ever. But if you really want to see what you can do, you want to see how far you can take your physique, you need a bit more. And primarily what you need is more volume. That is the biggest change that you need to make. You don't need to change too much in terms of exercises or too much in terms of programming. There is something to be said for a more deliberate, calculated type of periodization, which you will find in Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger. And there is something to be said for planning your training out in longer blocks. So in Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, you're looking at really just eight-week phases. In Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, you're looking at 16-week phases or macro cycles would be the technical term. But the primary difference that makes the intermediate program better for muscle and strength gain for intermediate and advanced weightlifters than the beginners, than Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, or Thinner, Leaner, Stronger, is just more volume. So in Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, you're going to be averaging somewhere around 15 hard sets per major muscle group per week. And simply by increasing the volume and doing it intelligently and deloading properly and making sure you're not just running yourself into the ground, that is going to drive new muscle gain and new strength gain more than anything else. And so, while this new book, Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger 2.0, is not going to be out until summer of next year to directly answer the question of what an intermediate or advanced weight liver can do with just bigger, leaner, stronger, as it's laid out in the book that's available, or thinner, leaner, stronger in its book. What can you do to make those programs more effective for an intermediate and advanced weightlifter? Add more volume. That's the easiest way to do it. And specifically, what you can do is you can take the bigger, leaner, stronger, or thinner, leaner, stronger workouts and start by adding an extra exercise in the workouts, three hard sets per exercise, just like how the workouts are laid out. So now you're going to be bumping the average weekly volume up uh, a little bit. You're going to be bumping it up from about 10 hard sets per major muscle group per week to 13-ish hard sets, because some are nine, some are 10, but you know, it's going to be somewhere around 10. You're bumping it up by, by an average of three. That change alone will be enough to start moving the ball again. And then once you've acclimated to that new increased volume, and it will take a little bit of a toll on you in the beginning, you are going to be a bit more sore than you're used to. Your joints are probably going to ache a little bit more than you're used to. You're going to feel a little bit more beat up than you're used to. But once you've gotten used to it, you can even increase the volume a little bit further. And I would recommend doing that just on your big like pressing workout, pulling workout, and squat workout, not adding even more volume to every workout per se, because it's going to be a bit overkill on your shoulders and your arms. But you can go up on your big press, your big squat, and your big pull workouts. So that means now you're going from first from about, let's say it's nine hard sets on a big squat workout to, to 12, getting used to that. And from there, even going up to 15 hard sets per week for your big lower body workout. And if you want to learn a bit more about periodization, because I did mention that earlier and that Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger 2.0 is going to be periodized differently than it currently is in 1.0 and, of course, differently than Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, you can head over to legionathletics.com and search for periodization and you'll find a long article I wrote, which comes from the book. Now, the implementation is different in the book because the program is different than what you'll find in the article, but it will give you uh, a good understanding of periodization on the whole, and it will give you a bit of a preview of how I'm going to be periodizing Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger 2.0. Okay, the final question is, should I stop eating red meat? And this is a question that 
ebbs and flows with documentaries these days. So when What the Health came out a couple years ago, I was getting asked this a lot and just getting asked about vegan dieting a lot. And so at the time, I put together a rather long and extensive review of What the Health, which I then also turned into a podcast. And this time around, of course, it is the Game Changers documentary, which I haven't done anything on yet, but I did just last week record a great informative podcast with Chris Kresser, who was recently on Joe Rogan to talk about it. And by the time this goes live, the Chris interview might be live. I don't remember how we have it laid out on the schedule, but if it's not live yet, it will be coming out very soon. And so that podcast will give a more extensive answer to that question that I'm going to give here. I'm just going to quickly give uh, an overview. But if you want to hear more about the details, then check out the interview with Chris Kresser that will either already be live or be coming out very soon. And so the simple answer is these documentaries are very misleading. They are outright propaganda, in my opinion, because... I can't believe that the misrepresentations of science that are in these documentaries are just mere oopsies. Just, oh, oops, we didn't know that that research doesn't say that at all. Or we didn't know that we completely cherry-picked our evidence and ignored the large body of evidence that says otherwise. You see, when you zoom out and you look at the weight of the evidence, when you look at what the overall body of literature is telling us, which is what you have to do with science. If you want to look into the science of something, you can't just look at a couple studies, even if they're high quality studies, you have to look at all the research that's available and then particularly look at all of the high quality research that's available and see what is the overall message here. And in the case of red meat consumption, a good example of this is a very comprehensive review of the literature that was just published in the Annals of Internal Medicine last month, uh, November 2019. And the message is that we are probably not going to benefit by reducing our red meat intake. And there is probably very little risk to eating red meat regularly. For example, one of the things we have to consider is that red meat is a great source of protein, which means that it can help with muscle building and help with fat loss because a high protein diet is better for both of, both of those things. And red meat is also good for our bone health and it's high in iron. So that reduces the risk of anemia, particularly in women. And although some studies in the past have indicated that eating a lot of red meat and particularly eating a lot of highly processed red meats like bacon and sausage and deli meats may be associated with an increased risk of various diseases, including cancer, the latest and highest quality evidence casts doubt even on that. That said, I don't agree with people who would say that red meat has been more or less exonerated entirely and you can eat all of the red meat that you want or even further, like in the case of the carnivore diet, that you should be eating red meat every day, multiple times per day, even if you don't like red meat. Again, when you look at the current body of evidence, it is not clear exactly what the long-term effects are of eating a large amount of red meat, and particularly the highly processed red meat products, but also just red meat in general. And so my recommendation is to zoom out even further and look at diet on the whole and say, okay, here's what we know. We know that there is a huge amount of evidence that eating a lot of fruits and vegetables and legumes and other plant foods is very healthy for us. So let's make sure that we're getting plenty of those foods in our diet. And if we do that correctly, it's going to eat up a lot of our calories. I mean, you don't need to be eating more than 40% or so of your daily calories from protein. So the remaining 60% of calories should be more or less from plant foods. And a portion of your protein can also be from plant foods. Animal proteins are better for the purposes of body composition and providing essential amino acids. But if you are getting most of your protein from animal products and then some of your protein from plant products, that's as well. That's, that is fine as well. And so when we look at red meat consumption in the context of a diet like that, and we add in exercise, 
I don't see any cause for concern if you want to have a serving or two of red meat every day. And if you don't, like I don't really, but I do have a couple servings per week. I like to make a homemade hamburger usually on the weekends, Friday and Saturday, I'll have a homemade hamburger. If I have some hamburger meat left over, I'll have a hamburger patty in my salad that I eat every day at lunch. And I have absolutely no qualms about that whatsoever. Nobody would be able to point to any credible scientific research that would indicate that's an unhealthy diet or an unhealthy way to live. All right, well, that's it for this q and I hope you found this information helpful. And if you did, please do give this video a like by clicking the little thumbs up guy down below and dropping a comment, letting me know what you thought. And if you really liked it, then subscribe to my channel. Just click the big red subscribe button over there and then click the bell next to it. It's free, of course, and YouTube will notify you when the next video goes live. And last, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the beginning of the video, if you want me to answer one of your questions on a Q&A episode, shoot it to me in Instagram DMs, Muscle for Life Fitness is my handle, or email to me, that's better, mike at muscleforlife.com, and you will hear back from me, certainly via email, hopefully via Instagram DM, and if it's a question that I think would be great for a Q&A episode, then I will answer it there as well. All right, well, that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.